weeks ago, I started this two-part series on Revelation's first death. And, uh, I want to start reading with verse 10 of Revelation 1. And dealt with verses 1 through 9. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. <clears throat> and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him. I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Isn't it nice to know that every one of these churches had an angel that was dispatched for that church? I kind of like to believe that we have an angel dispatched for abundant life. Hallelujah. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. I shared with you two weeks ago that I believe that the greatest need for the church in this hour, this end time hour, is to see Jesus Christ anew. The greatest need of every child of God is to see Jesus Christ afresh. To see Jesus Christ as He is. Who is this one who speaks to John? He is the Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. You can't get any better than that. Hallelujah. Praise God. He is the one who was dead and is alive forevermore. And the Scripture says He holds the keys of death and the grave in His hands. He is God Almighty, the Creator of everything. Now think about that for a moment. Who is this that's speaking to John? And who is this that's speaking to us today? And this One who is speaking, the Alpha, Omega, beginning, end, first and last, the One who is dead and is alive forevermore, wants to manifest Himself to you and me this morning. He desires to show you and me His glory. He wants to show and reveal Himself in the midst of the church. We, we sang this first song, Jesus be revealed. Jesus be revealed. Every time the family of God gets together, that should be our prayer. Lord, break in upon us. Reveal Yourself to us. Manifest Yourself to us. 
Let us get a fresh vision of who you are. And I will tell you that He delights today to show Himself strong on behalf of them that fear Him. Can you say Amen? You see, throughout all of Scripture, it's not man trying to find God. It's always God manifesting Himself to man and revealing Himself. He's always endeavoring to show Himself to His servants in a powerful and wonderful today, a wonderful way. And today, this one still walks the aisles of this congregation this morning, and He desires to manifest Himself to each and every one of us individually here today and collectively as a church. Can you say amen? I want to remind you that John, this apostle, was in the greatest hour of need. He had been boiled in oil twice. He was near 90 years old. Been boiled in oil twice and that didn't kill him. So they banished him to the Isle of Patmos, which was a volcanic island about 20 miles south of Ephesus where they put the most hardened criminals of the empire to live. He says in verse 9, I want to remind you that he is our brother in tribulation and suffering. So he knows what people go through. He understands the challenges and the adversity that we all must face. It's not a question, folks, whether one person suffers and another one doesn't. We all suffer. In this world, you shall have tribulation. But to the saint of God, he says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that is the one that's here in this service today. He is the one that's walking the aisles of this congregation. And he is the one that wants to manifest himself to you you see john was in need but hear me this morning god never ever forsakes his own and he will never leave us nor to ourselves and he is as close as the mention of his name and what is that name jesus he's as close as mentioning his name he says if you feel after him happily you will find him And Acts declares that if we will draw near to God, He will what? Draw near to us. So when you and I are in adversity or tribulation, just know that God will show up just as He did for John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos. Why, you ask? Because He loves us. He cares for us. I know that's hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to fathom. We think we have to do something to earn His love. We have to be good in order to merit His touch. But all you and I have to do here this morning is to recognize that we have a need in Jesus. That we need His presence in our lives. That we need to be filled to overflowing with His Holy Spirit. And if you and I will just reach out to Him on this service today, you will find that presence that you so, you and I so desperately need in this service. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now two weeks ago, I remind, shared with you three things that John said about this Savior of ours, ours, and I just want to just briefly touch on us. He said unto Him that loved us. I want to remind you, He loves us. He cares for us. You say, yeah, but pastor, you don't know how bad I've been this week. It doesn't matter. You're in the right place at the right time. And you can cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. You see, His love for us is not based on what, how good we've been. It's not a conditional love. We don't have to perform. We don't have to be anything. We just have to draw near to Him. In all of our sin and brokenness and iniquity, all of our faults and our failures. Unto Him, John reminds us, before before he can get into any message to the church, he reminds everyone, unto Him that loved us. And He loves us today. He didn't stop there. He said, unto Him that washed us from our sins 
with his own blood. We didn't save ourselves. We didn't wake up one morning and decide, you know, this is a good day to be saved. Never happened that way. If we ever woke up one morning and said, you know, I think I want to draw near to the Lord because God's love has been working in our hearts and our lives to draw us unto Himself. And for these that are being baptized today, I want you to know your sins are going to be washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Never to be remembered again. Is there anybody else that can remember that day? Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. My sins away. Oh, happy day. Hallelujah. How clean you felt. How washed you felt. How different you felt. Why? Because you and I were washed in His blood. That precious, sinless blood. He washed us from our sins. And the third thing He reminds us of unto Him that made us. Made us what? Kings and priests unto God. We represent the people to God. And we represent God to the people. And we are learning to rule and reign in Him through His power and His might. What, what a privilege it is to be used of the Lord. I said, what an honor it is to be involved in the kingdom of God that lasts forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah! 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 And I want to say to you and remind you that he says, it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. So we need not fear of failure or of loss or of rejection. God has made you and me kings and priests unto Him and to this lost and dying world. What a God and what a Savior we have. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And then he ends that portion of this first chapter by shouting out a doxology as he thinks on these things. Unto Him. Unto Him. Be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Oh, folks, He is so worthy of our worship today. He is so worthy of our praise. And, and I like what Paul said in 1 Timothy, 1st chapter, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's the one we worship today. That is the one we serve today. That is the one that's in this house this very moment. But I want to point out in this next passage, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a great voice, and I, it sounded like a trumpet. And, I, 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 and it's saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And he said, uh, I have a message for the churches. I want you to write them. But, but notice this, John needs a revelation of Jesus Christ before he can do that. Before people can hear the voice of God, they need to see Jesus afresh. Folks, we must see Jesus in this end time before the coming of the Lord. And that's not too far off, I believe. John says, I turned to see the voice that spoke to me and this is what I saw. And he's trying to describe it in his own terms, what he is seeing. He gets a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of these seven golden candlesticks was one likened to the Son of Man. He had in his hand seven stars. I saw him clothed with a garment down to his feet, and he had a golden girdle about his waist. His head and his hairs were white like snow, like wool. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet likened to fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. And oh, his voice. Oh, that voice was like the sound of many waters. Had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword. And when I looked at this one, his countenance was bright like the sun in its strength. 
I could barely make it out. I wonder today if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ could see Christ like this afresh. I wonder how this would change us. I wonder what effect it would have on how we lived and how we acted. I wonder, would this revelation move us at all? Would it have an impact upon us? I know it had an impact on John, and I'll tell you about it in just a moment. But when Christ gets ready to manifest Himself to you and me in all of His glory, and that is still His desire, you know, we say sometimes we're waiting on God. We're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. God is waiting for His people to open up their hearts and their spirits to Him in a, in a, in a, in a uh, unreserved way and say, God, I need You today. I need Your power. I need Your presence. I want You to manifest Yourself to me. Oh, we get too busy. We go our own way. But I just wonder what would happen to this church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this end time if we could just see Jesus Christ anew. Well, it had an impact on John. In verse 17, he says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And I want you to think about that for a moment. John was the youngest disciple of Jesus. He was the youngest of the twelve. He was the one on the Last Supper that laid his head on the shoulder and bosom of Jesus Christ. He loved Him. He was called the beloved disciple. But I want you to think about it. He's the youngest of the disciples when he's walking with Jesus. And he is called the disciple that had a real deep love for the Master. Now, He had not seen the Lord visibly for over 60 years. He had been with Him for three and a half years. He had followed His every step. He was there on the Mount of Olives when Jesus ascended up into heaven with clouds and glory prior to Pentecost. But here John is 60 years later and he sees the Lord again in a way that he had never seen him before. And John is so impacted. John is so stunned. John is so overwhelmed. John is so overpowered and blinded by this new vision of his Lord that the Bible says he falls at his feet as though dead. Can I tell you today that when God's people get a new and fresh vision of the Lord Jesus Christ in this end time, there will be things in us that will die and need to die. When we get a fresh vision of the Lord, like John saw, then there's going to be things that are going to die in us. He said, when I saw him, I became as a dead man. And when we see him afresh, there will be things that will die in us as well. Selfishness will die. Self-centeredness will die. Worldly desires will die in us. I love that old song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I wonder what would happen in the church today if we did just that. That we just didn't sing the words, but with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, we would turn our focus and our vision toward the Lord Jesus today and look full in His wonderful. And like the Greeks that came to the disciples one day, they said this to the disciples, we don't want to see anything, but we want to see Jesus. 
we want to see Jesus. How many know there's a lost and dying world that needs to see Jesus? We live in a crazy world. We live in so many things that are upside down and inside out. And the only hope of this world doesn't come from the White House or from Congress or from the State House. The only hope for this world and for you and me comes from heaven. Hallelujah. And it comes through the church house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so the church today in this end time desperately needs to see Jesus Christ afresh. There will be some things that will die in us and need to die. John said, I saw him. I fell fell at his feet like a dead man. You know, in this day of wokeness and modern thinking, far too many people are losing something that is very precious and necessary if we are to have a mighty manifestation and revelation of Jesus Christ. And that thing that we're missing today is reverence. I want to stop and talk about that. This is not a reverent age. Nothing is sacred anymore. There is no shame on anything. Human life is not sacred. Marriage and the home is not sacred. God in His church is not reverent, much less respected. There was a time that when to be a reverent person was an honorable thing and something to be admired. Now, it's disdained. It's despised. It's considered old-fashioned. Something to be scoffed at. Now, men and women want to be smart. We want to be clever. We want to be successful. And you see, reverence does not fit into that kind of philosophy of life. But without reverence, life is shallow. And there's little character and nobility in a person's life. The goal now is to see how many laws and rules one can break and not get caught. Or now... It is to be dismissed and not really important as the end justifies the means. One of the marks of the end time, Paul says, is that knowledge will increase. They'll be ever learning, but they're never ever coming to an understanding of the truth. He tells us they will be unthankful and they will be unholy. Psalms tells us because... The people lose their fear and their reverence of God. There are no changes in their lives. And then Psalms begins to list a few things. Identifier. Where people can know whether you're losing your fear of God or not. But one thing the church must not lose is its reverence of the Holy One. We sing it about Him today. Holy Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. He is the Alpha and Omega. Today, right here, right now, it should mark a holy reverence in our lives toward the Lord. People, it's sad to see that so many of our children have no reverence for God. You look across the landscape. They have no fear of God. No reverence of God. They have little respect for things of God and spirituality. And that's a sad thing to see. When children and teenagers are not reverencing the Lord. You see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding and knowledge and wisdom. We need to fear our Lord. You remember Belshazzar in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. He was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. What happened in, is that he lost his fear of God. And even though Daniel the prophet reminded him, you, you knew it, Belshazzar. You knew what God, who God was. And you knew what he was capable of doing. You knew it. You're not ignorant of God's power. But his failure resulted in his death 
and the kingdom falling that very night. You see, here's what Belshazzar did. He took the things that had been dedicated to God in the Jerusalem temple, in King Solomon's temple. When they ransacked the temple, they took all those valuable things back to Babylon. So he threw a big party. In those days, they didn't have a, you know, a two or three hour party. It went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Here, the Medes and the Persians were on the outskirts of the city, but he felt like that their city was impregnable, that no one could conquer it. The Medes and the Persians had surrounded it, so Belshazzar just threw a big party. It went on for some time. And in his drunken stupor, he said, go get the things that were dedicated to God. I want you to bring them. Go get the cups that were used for the kingdom of God, for the dedication of the temple, and we're going to drink out of them. So they went and got those cups that had been dedicated to the Lord, and everybody started drinking out of, their, out of these cups at this pagan feast that Belshazzar threw. God saw it. He saw the irreverence. He saw the disdain for the things of God. Can I tell you, it is important that we reverence the things of the Lord. That we hold them sacred. That we hold them close to our heart. Praise God. Praise God. Can I tell you that church attendance may be one of those things that we ought to reverence and hold? Just getting together with God's people. And when we get here, we're going to honor Him. We're going to love Him. We're going to praise Him. We're going to exalt Him. We're going to reverence Him. We're going to lift Him up. Because He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto Me. Well, Belshazzar didn't reverence the Lord. Big hand appeared in that big hall where they were feasting. And it began to write something on the wall. Many, many, tickle you farson. Which means, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. He sends for Daniel to interpret what was written on the wall. Daniel tells him what was written, but also tells him that you're going to die tonight and your kingdom is going to be lost. That's the lesson for us to learn today about taking the things that belong to God and using them for self and for our own selves. Paul said, Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies and in your spirit. We belong to the Lord today. And perhaps maybe there we just need a good old fashioned revelation and manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ to get us back on track, to get us back in reverencing the Lord and doing the things that he would have. You know, there was a story in the New Testament, and Jesus told this story. He says, I threw a real, there was this Lord who threw a great wedding feast. And uh, he, was, he was a guy that was uh, very prominent in, in, and a king, actually, in, in, in that particular area. And he sent out all these invitations to people that he knew. And the Bible says that each one began to make excuse about coming. Oh, I've got this to do, I've got that to do, I've got other things to do. But they did more than that. The Scripture, and I like the way the King James Version puts it, he says, they made light of it. They just didn't reject it. They made light of it. In other words, they counted this invitation as no big deal. It's something that, you know, you can just throw away in the trash can. You don't have to respond to it. It's no big deal that the king invited you to a wedding feast. It's no big deal. They made light of it. They made light of it. Can I say today that today is the day of salvation? We cannot make fun or make light of the things that God has given to us in His church today. Please do not make light of the king's invitation. If He is calling your heart, if He is speaking to your life, do not push it aside. Do not count it irrelevant. Do not make fun of that invitation as they did. 
I want you to know Jesus is calling you and me to Himself. I want to manifest myself. I want to reveal myself to you. So take it seriously and respond to His love. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time of His favor. So don't make light of such a gracious and wonderful invitation of salvation or an invitation of renewal or an invitation of just drawing close to the Lord. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's You shall. It's not a maybe. It's not a hope. So you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. John walked with Jesus for three and a half years. He saw Him heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. The lame walked. The blind saw. The sick were made whole. He was there to hear the Sermon on the Mount, the Constitution and Bylaws of the Kingdom. He was there on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus shone like the noonday sun. And they were there. Simon Peter, always sticking his foot in his mouth, said, well, let's build a tabernacle. Let's let's house this. You know, let's keep this here. When God says, no, I want this for everybody. I want this for you. God wants to reveal Himself to you today. Hear me today. God wants to reveal and manifest Himself to each and every one of us in a way that we have not known. And John saw Him in Revelation 60 years later. And he was so overpowered and overcome, I fell at his feet as dead. What you think, what we think we know about God, we know very little about God and his glory. What we think we've experienced up to now at the manifestation of God is but a drop in the bucket of what he wants to show you and me right here this day, right, right in this service today. I fell at his feet as dead. But this is not the end of the story. The Bible says that God put his hand on John and told him, don't fear. Don't be afraid. When God puts his hand upon you and me, when we humble ourselves to him and we begin to worship him, I want you to know God's hand will be upon you and me. And He'll take away all the fear of our lives. He will manifest Himself. And we will see Him as the Lord of glory. The Almighty. How much we need the hand of God on our lives today. We need His presence right now. This very moment in this service. And we need to remember once again. Unto Him that loved us. Unto Him that washed us. Unto Him that made us. I close with this passage. 1 John, the third chapter, verses 1 and 2. Praise God. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. What? For we shall see Him as He is. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Whatever manifestation we have seen God up till now will not compare to that day when He returns 
And He completes the work in our hearts and our lives. And we began to see Him as He is. There was a song I think that uh, Dottie Rambo wrote, We shall behold Him. We shall behold Him. In all of His glory, we shall behold Him. John says in the third verse, hear it? And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. You cannot have a revelation and manifestation of Jesus Christ and walk out of this service the same. Things are going to be different. Our lives will be different. The way we live will be different. And one of these days we're going to see Him as He is. Would you stand to your feet?